I'm uh, Vinishi Loboroy, a retired civil servant with a deep and abiding interest in the Northeast, a place that I have lived in, worked with, and proud to have served. And today I'm going to talk about the Trans Himalayan explorers. I'm going to talk about the pundits of Kumao and many other explorers. And of course, I'm going to talk about that great river, the Brahmaputra, which is perhaps the only truly transnational river that you would come across in the subcontinent. But the beginnings of my interest in both survey and in Tibet actually came from the school that I went to, which was in the foothills of the Himalayas. And fortunately, although I didn't quite understand that at that time, a stone's throw, maybe a couple of stones away from the survey of India. And it is to, to that and to the experiences that I gained and what I was taught and learnt and saw that I owe my interest in the Himalayas. This is the tale, a story of exploration, of mapping, but more than that, of few, very few brave, intrepid, observant men who traversed the Tibetan plateau, went across the plateau, went beyond it, came down again across the Himalayas back into India. All of this happened in just about a period of 50 years, perhaps from the 1860s to the early years of the 20th century. And that's one part of it, but the origins of survey itself go back, in fact, to many engineer officers of the Indian Army, beginning with James Rennell, who largely on secondary information, some observation, and a lot of men sent out, was actually able to produce some of the finest and best maps of India of that period and time. It's a story that goes back to the original seafarers. And while they are original, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, I think it would be good to remember that long before them, the Chinese, the Indians, and certainly the Arabs had been there, done this, and done that. They had traversed the oceans. They had carried goods and commerce long before the Europeans came, but the Europeans came fired with a new zeal, carrying not only commerce, not only conquest, but also the cross. And it is in that era that we began to see the emergence of mapping and survey, initially naval survey, relying very heavily on the Arabs. But in course of time, and this goes back to the Battle of Baksar, when the Mughals actually surrendered, surrendered revenue rights and territory in the wake of that battle, and the Diwani of Bengal came into the hands, into the eager hands of the British. But revenue meant that you had to map, you had to survey, you had to assess, and you had to collect. And that appellation, the collector continues. In the civil services, Many of us have been collectors, but collectors of what? We were collectors of revenue. We were settlement officers. And that's where the term and the origin comes from. But another disclaimer, although this is also about the opening up of Tibet, but Tibet has not been not only the roof of the world, it's also been the crossroads of the world, or at least of the high altitude world. Chinese, Mongols, Indians, Central Asians have all moved across the plateau, have all been in search of elusive either nirvan or gold or riches. And there have been periods of time when Tibet was closed to the outside world. It is perhaps coincidence, perhaps not, that when the Europeans began to take an interest Tibet was closing down to the outside world. But to go back to the survey, 
away from James Rennell and to the next great phase, one of the most monumental of surveying feats in the world, the Great Ark, owes itself not to an engineer officer, but an infantry officer, Charles Lampton. And Charles Lampton began the Great Ark, the triangulation of the Indian subcontinent. Slow progress. There were lots of people who doubted what was being done and why it was being done. These are stories that could fill a book. And Charles Lampton died lonely in an unmarked grave he rests somewhere in the heart of India, in central India. But by then he had already completed at least 40 to 50% of the survey. It was both north to south, actually south to north, and it was east to west and the other way around. But by the 1840s and 50s, it was approaching the Himalayas. And on this stage entered a man who is far better remembered, partly because of the peak named after him, George Everest. George Everest was a very different man from Lambton. Lambton was all that you could hope and wish for in a, in a boss. He was kind, he was gentle, he was understanding, he was caring. Everest was, to put it in a word, cantankerous. And he drove his men. He drove them hard, but he drove them towards the Himalayas. And finally, as superintendent of the Great Ark, the survey, the GTS, the trigonometrical survey, he was at Missouri. He refused to move down to head the Survey of India to Calcutta, and the Survey of India came to Dehradun, where it still is to this day. For some reason, the Naval Hydrographic Survey is also there. Again, it was George Everest, and it was named after him, not because he would have wanted it. Through his life, he rebelled against the thought of naming peaks, features, rivers, after the surveyors, and he would have resisted it. But it was his successor who insisted, and the successor based himself on one of the most fascinating Bengali surveyors of that period, Radha Khan Sikdar, who was a ma mathematician of extraordinary ability, who did the computations, who did them all in a matter of days, what had taken many other surveyors months, and they still hadn't achieved it. But it was also a period when a host of other survey organizations came. There was the geological survey, there's the botanical survey, there's the zoological survey. This thirst for knowing about peoples and cultures and partly to be carried back as objects, as objects of curiosity and some knowledge and learning to the museums of Europe. But it's the survey of India that I'm concerned with today. And it's the survey that actually led to the emergence of what are now known as the surveyor pundits. To be fair, they were not pundits. They were Rawats from Garhwal, from, the, from Milam, from the upper Joram Valley. And they were brought together by an innovative survey officer called Montgomery, who actually realized pretty early that all of the Europeans traversing the Tibetan plateau were not able to make progress and you would need pilgrims or surveyors disguised as pilgrims or as close as they could be. And what better than the Rawats of Kumau? And so they came to be trained at Missouri and the training was amazing. It was actually in retrospect and hindsight something that befits the time and age. They were disguised as pilgrims. In their staffs were concealed instruments, papers, scrolls, writing instruments, all of these to conceal whatever they were doing. And they worked, they plodded across the plateau instead of the 108 beads that a Buddhist rosary would have. Their rosary chain had a hundred it was easier, and they were paced. They spent almost six to eight months walking through Missouri, accompanied by a drummer, so that the paces would be just right. The pace would be the same whether you went up or down or level. 
And these are the men who actually traversed Tibet. The best known, and perhaps not the first, but one of the first, was Nain Singh. There were others, and they came from all parts of northern India. They were Punjabi Muslims, they were Ladakhi Buddhists, they were the Rawats. There was even a Sikhmese in there, a Lepcha. And these men, I'd like to be able to talk about just three of them, because I think they illustrate what was done in those years and what has been achieved and what we have learned and what we should remember. So Nain Singh Rawat was perhaps the first. He was not a stranger. The Rawats had long been familiar with Tibet. They were traders. In one direction would move borax, the hides would move, wool would move, precious stones would move, and very occasionally gold. It was a trade that was carried on for hundreds of years, a trade based on barter, on trust. And just the word of a man, each one of them had a Tibetan counterpart, and of course, the other way around. And these very small caravans, but largely on foot, were permitted, even in the days when Tibet was closed, to cross those frontiers. It was now that Tibet was really beginning to close in. So Nain Singh Rawat was the first, and accompanied occasionally by a cousin, a younger relative. He actually surveyed Western Tibet, Mansarovar, beyond to the Pamirs. He walked all these. He was a man who made it all the way to Shigatse in eastern Tibet, well, on the, the borders of eastern Tibet, and actually to Lhasa. He had an audience with the Panchen Lama. He was afraid because he thought he would be discovered. He actually went to the great hall in which the Dalai Lama was. But he walked millions of steps and he recorded it. And it was an outstanding success that led to those large blanks on those maps gradually being filled. Following him was his cousin, a younger cousin, Kishan Singh Rawat, who lived much longer and traversed much further. And from Western Tibet, he made it across the Tibetan plateau, following the river, following the tributaries into Northern Tibet, and was on his way to Mongolia before he turned back, one of the first of the pundits to re-enter India, not through the Western accesses, but through Tawang. And the third member of, of the third person I'd like to talk about was actually a tailor in, in Darjeeling, a lepcha, a lepcha tailor. And there he was, and in a later period, he was picked up to move through Tibet and find what was the one remaining riddle that was left. And what were these riddles? Mapping was important, survey was important, the commerce, the culture, the politics of the place, all these were faithfully noted by the pundits. I've just spoken of two as yet, but at any point of time, you could have had 10 or 15 of them hunched, braving those terrible icy winds, plodding through those arid deserts. And there they were, the pundits, as they moved back and forth. But over time, <clears throat> it was reasonably established that the headwaters, the source of some of the major subcontinental rivers, the Indus, the Satluj, the Sangpo, and these all transcend the Himalayas, they're transcendent rivers. They do not, they, they, they predate the Himalayas, actually come from a few hundred kilometers of each other in Western Tibet. The other mystery was, of course, the great chain of rivers of Southeast Asia, of the Iravadi, of the Salwin, the Sangpo, which nobody was quite clear about, and of course, the Yellow River, the famous Yellow River of China, the River of Sorrow. And that gap was not yet closed. There was talk of a gorge, a deep gorge. Nobody had actually been through it. And in fact, till almost into the 21st century, nobody still had. 
So Kintup, the tailor, was sent with the Chinese Lama into Tibet. The Chinese Lama must obviously have had monastic duties, but he seems to have paid more attention to pleasures of the flesh, to wine and women, and it landed up with Kintup being sold as a slave in exchange for the monk's freedom. And the monk disappeared to China, leaving Kintup there. It was a simple task. It was not as complicated as the others who surveyed and meticulously recorded. His job was actually much simpler. It was to cut and float logs down the Sangpo. And on this side, in the Siang River, there would be watchers who would wait. And if the marked logs came down, then you knew long before satellites and everything else made it possible that yes, it was the same river. But Kintup was delayed because the Lama had others' thoughts on his mind. And when he did get his freedom after a year and a half, in fact, almost two, he continued. He continued his pilgrimage. He went to Lhasa. He went down the river, the Sangpo. He cut logs. He marked them. He threw them in the river. But by that time, the, the English surveyor had not only left India, he had left India for England and died. There was nobody there to watch the logs. There was nobody who could link the two together. And in that, we lost, at least for 20 years, some of that knowledge. And Kintup retired into penury, into poverty, and went back to being a tailor. So these were, and I say this illustratively, three of the men who made this possible, who opened a frontier that was still not open. It is not as if others did not make the effort. Many did. Some failed. The Schlagenweit brothers of Bavaria, five of them, extraordinary people. They journeyed across from Europe through Central Asia, through Tibet, skirting Tibet, down into India. The Survey of India didn't like them very much, but they continued. One of them quite, quite um, drastically lost his head in the process. He was beheaded at Kashgar. But the wealth of information that they brought back is still some of the finest. But to return to the Kintup and the Sangpo story, and I have to say this at this point of time, because the Sangpo, as I said, is actually the Siang, is the Brahmaputra, will become the Padma and the Meghna in Bangladesh. It's an extraordinary river, because along its banks are so many cultures, so many people, that there isn't, in my mind, a river quite like that. So many fates across. And all of them, and at every stage, every 30, 40, 50 kilometers, something changes. From the arid deserts of Tibet to the lush environments of Arunachal, right down to the plains of Bangladesh, it's an extraordinary journey. It's thousands of kilometers through Tibet, 300 odd kilometers through Arunachal, another five, 600, by which time it's already in the plains is just 300 feet above sea level and then into Bangladesh. So it's an extraordinary river. And access to it was firmly, firmly denied. But the Abor expedition of 1912 and 13, when a missionary and a deputy commissioner had both been hacked, actually led to a spurt in exploration. And among the explorers were people, there was Frederick Bailey, who the Indian Army would long remember for the Bailey Trail, who journeyed in. They found time for many other pursuits. It was not just survey. The famous blue poppy of the Tibetan plateau actually owes itself, or the fact that it's well known, to Bailey and to young husband. In 1904, preparations began and at that point of time for this expedition, which was to go to Lahasa, and at that point of time, the search began for Kintup because only he knew, and he knew where the routes were, and he had the records. They found him seven or eight years later, 
just in time for the Shimla conference. And his contribution, I think, is still remembered when you talk of India's borders with the countries around it. The Brahmaputra itself has long been for me a personal favorite. It's been a personal favorite partly because I'm familiar with it. And as I said before, it's been an extraordinary river. But I have very fond and happy memories of the Brahmaputra, of standing on its banks at a police station with the sub inspector and hearing this extraordinary sound. And I said, what is that? And he said, no, it's just the police station falling into the river, which it did, of course. But it did that an hour or two later. To his credit, he salvaged the records before the police station went into the river. It's a river which has the largest river island in the world, almost a thousand square kilometers. There is no other freshwater island of that magnitude anywhere inhabited in the rest of the world. For the Assamese, in myth, legend and song, it's the Lohit which is the Brahmaputra, the Red River, which also comes from Tibet. But it's not the Siang. And the Siang is geographically correctly the Brahmaputra. It's a majestic river. But it's the Lohit which has stirred emotion and occasionally agitation throughout Assam. But when I think of the Ramputra, I also think of a vast plain, a plain that has suffered earthquake, a river that has changed course so often, and a river that has had so many different civilizations come on either bank. The Mughals never quite made it up the Brahmaputra. They did it once, in fact, they did it twice. And the Mughals had these great chroniclers and the Arab chronicler wrote, this land is not like our land. Its sky is not our sky. He could have gone on and the powerful Mughal army did go on. The Assamese didn't quite play right. They disappeared from their capital leaving the Mughals at Gargan for six, eight months. Between monsoon and the malaria, half the force, half the army was decimated. The rest straggled back, except for a contingent of Sikh soldiers who stayed behind and are still there. These four villages in central Assam, which speak Assamese, not Punjabi, which eat rice, not roti. They are Assamese in all but name, but yes, they are Sikh, and they are the remnants of an invading force. Not many invading forces made it. The Burmese did for a period of seven years. It's the British who brought, and maybe the binding force was tea, to the Brahmaputra Valley opportunity and commerce. But otherwise, it's been a land which has taken in, which has welcomed, and has been a melting pot. There is no other place in India that I know of where you can hear so many languages come across so many different people with so many different origins from Southeast Asia to Mongolia, from the highlands of Tibet just across and from Western India and beyond. So it's a fascinating place and the river has shaped, has shaped the valley in a way that rivers can do and often do, but it's also shaped the people and the culture. So to me, this is a river that carries an extraordinary reverence, not only for what it has done, but what it can do. I have seen the river in flood at Dhubri, which is easily 28 kilometers across. I have seen it rage through Upper Assam and go through its floodwaters going through the paddy fields. I have seen it in my districts. And it's a river with great, great power. At a time when most Indian rivers are actually now hemmed in with dams, with irrigation channels, so far 
all that we have been able to put there are bridges. But let's see, the river has seen a lot and it's seen at least four major earthquakes in the last 150 years. But it's also a place where um, you've had some of the great technological innovations and the Burmese and before them the Shans and after them the British brought both technology and innovation in a way that nobody would have thought would have been possible. But the river has also shaped and the region has also shaped people. Young husband, Francis Young husband was the arch imperialist. One of Lord Curzon's proteges led the column, in fact, three columns into Lahasa, Sola Topi. We know that in his baggage there were 67 white linen shirts. He carried them all the way and he used all of them, which we also know. But on his way back from Lhasa, Francis' young husband talks of seeing this llama on this grassy knoll just below Lhasa. And for him, it was a mind-changing experience because less than 15 years on, in five years, he had left the Indian Army. 15 years on, he was actually propounding a new faith, a new religion, which is what he did for the rest of his life. Those mountains can change people. That region can change people. And there is a saying in the same Mughal chronicles that if you stay too long here, you will become off the soil, you will become like them. And that is what the Brahmaputra did.